He had a week, maybe a little more, to get whatever needed doing here done before the big railway man wanted his little errand fulfilled. Jacob, of course, had no intention of doing a damn thing that happy asshole wanted. He had agreed and took the man's money only to prevent more bloodshed. And now he was up against the clock, a week to serve God's will and ride out of town. You must be born, he said, looking up at the sky. When he got no reply, he headed up the street towards the waiting boarding house. The boarding house was a dusty two-story affair with a cantina on the ground floor. As Jacob entered, the smell of hot cooking chili assaulted his senses, making his stomach growl noisily. At the end of the room stood a sawdust plank bar. Behind it, a woman worked busily, stirring a huge pot on a nearby blackened stove. Jacob walked across the room, not minding the few other patrons, but plonking himself down on a nearby stool and coughing politely. The woman turned to face him and smiled warily, the dark smudges under her eyes evident of more than one restless night. Senor, she said in a thick Spanish accent. I'll be needing a room, ma'am, Jacob said, tipping his hat, and a large bowl of that uh, fine-smelling chili. The woman shuffled her feet and bit at her bottom lip, and Jacob realized that under the frown lines of tired eyes, she was really quite beautiful. Is there a problem, ma'am? It's money. I have enough money to pay for everything. No, the woman smiled. It's not the money. I need the money badly, but I must tell you the truth. There is sickness in the house. Yeah, so I heard. But it's only one man, correct? The English professor? Yes, he is the only sick one here, but there are others in the village that are also ill. The men who worked up at the temple are all ill. Some have even passed away from some sort of terrible, wasting sickness. Yet their families all seem to be fine. Some say that place is cursed. The professor believes it could be a miasma from the ancient tomb, but it's hard to tell. He raves a lot due to the fever. Certain lights were starting to flicker in Jacob's mind now, and he knew that somehow this professor was something to do with why he had been sent to this place. Well, Jacob replied, doesn't sound like it's too catching. I have business here I must attend to. I'll pay you double for the room. How about that? Okay, the woman replied. But if you get ill, I want no blame. I hear you, Jacob said, putting on his best smile. Now how about a bowl of that chili? His room was small, clean, well kept, and more than enough for Jacob's simple needs. After his meal... Jacob washed up and tried to read from his Bible, but the words were blurred, and he found himself tired after so many long days on the trail. Screw it, he said, yawning loudly. Just a quick nap, and we'll go see this English professor. As soon as his head hit the pillow, he was sound asleep. He awoke in the darkness, the scream ringing in his ears. For a moment, he thought that he was dreaming, then the same ear-splitting scream rang out again. Cursing, he grabbed up his gun belt, strapped it on as he ran across the hall and down the stairs. There was a large crowd now gathered in the street. Jacob pushed through the crowd until he reached the front. There he saw a woman, disheveled and wild, surrounded by men. Chupacabra! She screamed. Chupacabra! One of the men closest to her put a big hand over her mouth and dragged her away, sobbing and screaming. Jacob was about to go after them when a hand fell on his shoulder. He turned around ready to be angry, but it was his landlady from the cantina. He searched for name. Uh, An Anita, he said, drawing her to one side. What was the name she was screaming? The woman shook her head sadly. She's one of the men's wives from the dig site. Her husband's just died. I think the grief may have driven her mad. Perhaps, but I would know anyway, Jake insisted. What is Chupacabra? It's nothing. An old myth. A devil dog that's supposed to drink the blood of goats and even people, often when they're sick or dying. Where does this woman live? Take me there. No need, she said, pointing across the street. It's just there, three doors down. Jacob thanked her and headed toward the house. The door was still open. Hello? He called, standing at the threshold. Hello? When nobody answered, he stepped in closing the door behind him. The house was small and smelled of poverty, 
All splintering tables and rough-hewn chairs, a rickety-looking staircase led to the upper floor. Drawing his gun, Jacob headed on up, wincing at every creak underfoot. The palm of his hand started to sweat. The upstairs was more of the same, with rough plank floors and crumbling plaster. He passed a room and glanced inside, but it held nothing but a few dusty-looking crates and half-weaved baskets. The only other room was at the end of the hall. The door had been thrown open. To Jacob, it looked like a dark mouth waiting to swallow him whole. Taking a deep breath, Jacob leapt into the doorway, eyes searching the shadows. But there was only a flickering candle and the dead man lying in bed, his eyes closed. Jacob thought it looked almost as if the man was sleeping. He stepped in, looking for any signs of violence or struggle. But there was nothing. Approaching the bed, he sat down. That's when he saw the blood. A single drop marred the white sheets. Sorry, Jacob said, gently removing the sheet, looking for any injuries, but the man's nightshirt was blessedly free of blood. Covering the man's body back over, Jacob grasped the man's jaw, looking for any kinds of hemorrhaging. That's when his fingers brushed the wound at the man's throat. Well, well, well. What do we have here? Jacob said, turning the man's jaw and inspecting the wound. There were puncture marks, of that Jacob had no doubt. The bruising around the wound showed that whatever had made them had been driven in with a terrible force. The hole marks were jagged and horribly mangled. Teeth, Jacob grimaced. Goddamn teeth. Suddenly, the dead man shot upright, scrambling at Jacob's throat, his eyes burning black holes, his face white with terror. She's come, he screeched, fixing Jacob with a terrible gaze. She's come, he gasped, his grip falling away. As he sank back down into the bed, his haunted eyes closed. He took one last shallow breath before lying still. Jesus, Jacob said, quickly checking the man's pulse. There was nothing. If the man wasn't truly dead before, he sure as shit fire was now. That's when Jacob noticed the marks. They were fading right before his startled eyes. It took less than five seconds and they were gone like they had never been. Could it be? Jacob said, standing. Could it really be? He hurried down the stairs, grabbing up a burning lamp before heading out to the cold night air. Two men approached, perhaps grieving family members. They saw Jacob leave the house, saw the look on his face and veered off to the right to let him pass. He headed round the back of the house, head into the brush. Burning lantern held aloft. Come on, you son of a bitch, he said, scanning the sand. There! He grinned, his face almost ghoulish in the lamplight. There you are. He looked at the large tracks that led away from the building. He followed them for some time, watching as the tracks warped and changed with almost every step. Now they were wolf-like. Then they began to thin out and grow longer. As he entered a small grove of sun-blasted trees, the tracks suddenly stopped. Jacob traced his finger around the tracks, now completely human and small, almost like those of a young girl or a petite woman. Standing, he scanned the brush and the tops of the swaying trees, but there was nothing. Only the sighing of the wind, chilling his flesh and whispering like an omen of death in his ear. Jacob awoke the next day, well past noon. His head felt thick, and he cursed himself for a damn fool for sleeping so late. Going downstairs, he grabbed the bite to eat. If what he believed about the creature that was haunting this village was true, then he was going to need some supplies, and the only place to get what he needed would be from the church. But first, he wanted to speak to this English professor, perhaps to confront his suspicions more fully. Heading back upstairs, he stood outside the professor's door and listened, but it was all quiet inside. He knocked sharply. Professor! Hey! Professor, you in there? He waited. When there was no reply, he simply barged in. The room was barrack neat, and also completely empty. That was empty of the professor. All his things remained, including a large money clip and a gold watch on the bedside table. 
The only movement was the blowing curtains as the afternoon wound down towards the evening. Strolling to the window, Jacob looked outside. Seeing nothing, he slammed it shut and looked around for something, anything, that could help him. Some notes or a journal, perhaps. But there was only a few piles of dirty clothes and some mud-stained boots. Heading back outside, he gently closed the door and hurried downstairs. He found Anita there, her hips swaying mesmerizingly as she prepared the evening meal. Anita, would you say that professor's name was again? He said, leaning heavily against the bar. Engelbert, she said, slicing up an onion. Alfred Engelbert. When was the last time you saw him? Only this morning, she said, looking up a little more concerned now. Why do you ask? He's not in his room. What? She said, putting down her knife and wiping her hands on a nearby dish towel. How can that be? I saw him this morning. He was worse than ever, sweating and talking in riddles. What did he say, Anita? I, I don't know. I couldn't make out all that much. Something about a woman and eyes in the blackness. Jacob rode hard, heading for the nearby church. At the outskirts of town, he hadn't looked forward to seeing the Reverend again, but in times like this, any port in a storm. Still, by the time he arrived, the sun was starting to set in the west. Only the spire of the church remained in sunlight. Jumping from his horse, he stopped, taking in the atrocity that was spread across the church's front steps. It was the Reverend. What was left of him, anyway. The man had been disemboweled. His pipes and steaming organs spread all about. The air was thick with the smell of blood and shit. From around the corner, there came a strange chanting in a coarse, harsh language. Drawing his gun, he slid around the corner. Kneeling in the middle of the cemetery was what Jacob believed to be the missing professor. He was a small man, bald and bespectacled. He was reading from an ancient-looking parchment, glowing torches all around him. The blood on his hand looked almost black in the growing night. Professor, what the hell are you doing? The professor's head shot up, and he glared at Jacob. The ground must be made bitter so her followers may arise. She hears their screams from the ground and comes to free her children from the York of Christ God, for her gods were old when the world was still young. Now there was rumbling in the earth as if the very ground writhed in agony. A nearby grave off to Jacob's left began to tremble and vibrate. Right in front of Jacob's startled eyes, the grave dirt began to flow and withdraw, birthing a flame-eyed monstrosity back into the world, and Jacob knew that he now stood on unhollow ground. The professor howled in delight and began his vicious chant once again. Another grave began to tremble and churn. No, you don't, Jacob growled, raising the pistol. He shot the mad professor between the eyes. The newly raised vampire hissed. Metzitli will kill you slowly for this. Oh, so slowly. My mistress is the goddess of night. Fuck your mistress and fuck you too, Jacob growled, firing his smoking pistols into the snarling fiend who loped forward. Jacob's bullets passed through the creature's body as if smoke. Jacob expected as much, but it was an old habit, almost a reflex by now. Turning, he ran for the church, the snarling creature hot on his heels. He burst through the door, but the creature didn't even slow, following him inside. You've trapped yourself, fool. This place holds no power over us. Now the ground here has been made unhallowed by the blood of that false priest. Turning, Jacob grabbed up the wooden cross from the altar as the creature approached. Don't you listen, the creature giggled obscenely. Your god's been driven from this place. His symbol is no more than a wooden stick to me now. Sometimes a stick's all you need, Jacob said as the creature lunged forward. Quickly, he stepped to the left and the creature's claws dragged into his arm as he brought the wooden cross down on top of its head, shattering it in two. The creature howled, its vile blood pouring down its face, blinding its eyes. Jacob tried to pull free, knowing the creature would drag him forward with its great strength. Using its own momentum against it, Jacob thrust the now splintered cross up into its ribcage, piercing the diseased heart beneath. The creature let out a single ear-piercing shriek, its fanged mouth tearing its foaming lips to shreds before falling into a bloody heap at Jacob's feet. If we weren't in a church, I'd piss on your bones, Jacob spat into the dead creature's face. But for now, that'll have to do. Jacob hurried out of the church and over to the professor's body. Leaning down, he grabbed up the ancient-looking parchment from which the professor had been reading. 
not liking the feel of it in his hands. He cursed, throwing it back down, not understanding the strange symbols written there. Kneeling down, he frantically began rummaging through the dead man's pockets. Finally, he came up with a small, leather-bound book. He flipped it open and began to scan the written pages. The journal was well written, and for the first few pages, in a good order, but turned into the ramblings of a madman as the writings progressed. From what Jacob could make out, the professor had gone about a mass excavation of the ruins, uncovering a small pyramid-like structure mostly intact and covered with Aztec symbols and strange writing. From what the professor could decipher, the ruin was some kind of temple, a place of sacrifice to the goddess of night and the bringer of death. The writing spoke of a curse within, but unperturbed, the professor cleared the entrance and with a small party ventured within. After that, the pages turned to chaotic ramblings of a madman, talk of blood rituals, and eyes in the darkness, and a voice that called in the wind. Soon after, the deaths had begun, and the professor, now completely insane, had given himself over to whatever evil he had inadvertently let loose upon the world. Standing, Jacob pocketed the journal and mounted his horse, riding through the night-shrouded village until he reached the gleaming railway tracks, following them for about a half mile before they suddenly stopped. Jacob could hardly believe what he was seeing. The ground here was scorched and blasted. A huge crater lay like a blight upon the earth. In its center sat a gray, crumbling pyramid, shrouded in shadow. Clamoring from his horse, Jacob began to frantically search through his saddlebag, knowing his revolver would be of little use in the situation. Instead, he pocketed his Bible and a few glass vials of holy water. He also had his hunting knife, sharp and silver-edged. Strolling over to the crater, Jacob took his crucifix from under his shirt, muttered a quick prayer, and began to climb down a rickety-looking set of ladders bolted to the crater's side. As he descended, a wave of dread passed over him, making the hair on the back of his neck stand to attention and the skin of his arm to break out in great knots of goose flesh. It was as if the temple oozed with every essence of evil. Jacob felt the first real stirrings of fear, but crushed it ruthlessly as he hit the crater floor and headed towards the slouching entrance. Just then, something skittered in the darkness and Jacob rolled around, hands falling towards his gun. But there was nothing there. Only the sighing of the wind. Yet Jacob had a feeling he was being watched, assessed. Slowly, his eyes searched the darkness. He reached inside his jacket and withdrew a glass vial of holy water. Immediately, the vial began to glow the blessed water burning like liquid fire within. Jacob smiled grimly, feeling the power of God. The unholy will be consumed by his righteous flames, he said, stepping forward, driving back the darkness, but there was nothing there. If there had ever been. Jumping at shadows, Jacob muttered, turning back towards the entrance. He headed inside. The first thing he came to was a set of stone steps, leading down into the Stygian gloom. Taking a deep breath, he headed down. The grime of centuries gritting beneath his run-down boot heels. His own shallow breathing echoed all about him. His body soaked with a cold sweat. After what felt like a lifetime, he reached the bottom. Raising the glowing vial, he pushed back against the darkness. Mother of God, he gasped his eyes growing wide as he took in the crumbling walls all about him. There were skulls, hundreds, no, thousands, imbued in the stone. Their grinning jaws and glaring eyes seemed to follow him as he slowly shuffled past. There was a smell in the air now, a smell that Jacob knew well. It was the smell of death and fly-blown maggots. The smell intensified as Jacob moved forward before coming towards a small antechamber. Damn it, Jacob said, shaking his head sadly as he saw two bodies sprawled inside. Even with the strains of decay upon them, Jacob easily recognized the bodies of Callion and his wife Kate. I am sorry, Jacob said, kneeling beside them and twining their fingers together, trying hard not to look at their ruined throats. I ain't sure if you're with your gods or mine, but wherever you are, I hope your boy's there with you. That said, 
He stood and walked away. His fear replaced with a deep, burning anger. He turned another winding corner before coming to an abrupt halt. Before him was another set of stone steps leading down to a large subchamber, lit by hundreds of flickering candles that cast writhing shadows amongst the massive stone pillars. At the back of the room lay a huge obsidian throne. Sat upon it was the most beautiful woman Jacob had ever seen. She was completely naked, apart from the heavy gold bands that decorated her upper arms and her ankles. Her skin was the color of honeyed caramel, and her hair black as raven's wings, where it cascaded over one perfectly rounded shoulder. At the sound of Jacob's approach, she raised her head, the illusion of beauty shattered as she glared at him through crimson eyes. "'Why have you come here, mortal?' she hissed at him through fang teeth. "'Have you come to make a sacrifice of yourself unto the goddess?' "'He ain't no goddess,' Jacob growled, ascending the steps. "'You're nothing more than a blood-sucking parasite with a jumped-up opinion of yourself.' "'You dare mock me!' she screeched, leaping to her feet. "'Sure, come get yourself some, bitch!' With a scream of outrage, she flung herself at him. Jacob didn't even see her move, and then she was upon him. There was a sound of crunching glass, and she leapt away, howling in pain, her flesh smoking as the holy water burned like acid. Jacob wasn't even sure what had happened until he realized that in the ferocity of her attack, she had crushed the vial of holy water he had been carrying between them. She was fast, incredibly fast, and Jacob realized he was only still alive through the grace of God. How does that feel, bitch? He said drawing his hunting knife with one bleeding hand. His voice was full of bravado, but he was quickly backing up, desperate to get some distance between himself and this howling monstrosity. She was slinking towards him now, her ruined flesh still smoking. I will kill you for this, she drooled, for marking my sacred body. I will kill you slowly. For a thousand nights you'll scream. Jacob said nothing but snatched his now glowing cross from around his neck, holding it out before him like a shield. You talk a good talk, Jacob said, weaving his knife before him. But this time, she did not rush forward, but slid around a crumbling pillar, merging with the darkness. Jacob didn't wait, but rushed her, throwing himself, knife slashing. She wasn't there. From above him came the sound of falling pebbles and coying dust. Jacob looked up just in time to see her detach herself from the ceiling, driving him down to the ground, talon-like nails, shearing through his shoulders, sending his glowing cross sailing into the darkness. In a last-ditch attempt to save himself, Jacob rammed his knife into her ribs, missing her black heart by mere inches. She screamed in agony and flung the knife from her, her lower jaw unhinged until her mouth gaped impossibly wide, and Jacob realized, to his horror that she meant to crush his skull between her chomping jaws. Closing his eyes, Jacob committed his soul to God, knowing he was finished. But death never came, only blood, freezing cold blood pouring down upon him, drenching his face and clothes. And just like that, the weight of her was gone, and her headless body tumbled to the side. Quickly, Jacob wiped the foulness from his face and staggered to his feet. I thank you for your assistance, the soft female voice said. I could not have destroyed her on my own if you had not hurt her so badly. Drawing his gun, Jacob emerged out of the darkness. There was a woman sat upon the floor. Her skin was the color of pale moonlight. Her hair, flaxen. She wore a modern-day dress covered in blood, and she cradled the creature's decapitated head in her lap. Who the hell are you? Jacob said, scooping up his glowing cross and quickly putting it around his neck. My name is Babette, the woman said, wiping tears from her face. She was my maker, my mother in darkness. I sensed her awakening and hoped the madness that had sacrificed her may have passed after such a long sleep for five hundred years. She slumbered in this place. But it was not to be. If anything, her affliction had only worsened. She believed herself a god. She was a gentle creature once, only feeding on the baser creatures, or men that carried evil in their hearts, but the long eons drove her mad. 
We lose so much over the long centuries. Can you believe such as us can love? She said, looking up at Jacob. No, Jacob said, shaking his head. I believe you only remember a trace of what you used to be. Human, you mean, she said, placing the head down gently and standing to face him. Like you. Yeah. Like me. You know, I can't let you leave this place. She smiled then, showing a hint of fang. You can't stop me, Jacob. Besides, I saved your life. Does that count for nothing? I have no desire to fight you. You know... You know my name? Yes, she said, gliding forward. I've been watching you ever since you hit town. There's a fire that burns within you, Jacob. Be careful it doesn't consume you. Jacob thought on her words. Yeah. Guess you did save my life. And for that I owe you, but... You have to leave this place and these people in peace. Give me your word on that, lady. Or are we gonna have to go round after round right here? I have no intention of staying here, Jacob. I grow tired of the new world. I wish to return to my homeland and sleep. Perchance, to dream. She smiled, slinking past him, and, and just like that, she was gone. Jacob let out a breath he didn't even realize he had been holding, suddenly feeling his aches and pains as he staggered up the steps through the winding tunnel, and at long last, into the fresh night air. By the time Jacob had finished his work, the sun was rising in the east. He stood on the ridge, detonator in hand, and gleaming railway tracks beneath his feet. And behold, a hand lay upon me, he anointed, and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said unto me, O Daniel, son of man, most greatly and beloved, Give heed to the words that I speak to you, and stand upright. For I have taken heed to your prayers, and will exalt you before all the nations. That said, he pushed the plunger down, throwing up his arms as a great roar, and deafening boom was washed out across the land, burying the ruined temple beneath the shattered earth forever. Jacob climbed up upon his horse and headed west, following the railway tracks. Progress was coming to the west, and Jacob wondered if there was any room left for a God-fearing man. He looked towards the heavens, but there was no reply. Only the blazing sun and the sweet smell of the desert for now that was enough Jacob rode on his shadow growing longer a grey rider upon a pale horse Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and it is currently September, which means that we're getting dangerously close to Halloween. For those of you guys who are following me here on YouTube, thank you so much for watching as we get closer and closer to the Halloween countdown, and thank you so much for hitting that subscribe button and the bell so that you don't miss out on the Halloween countdown. And for those of you who are listening on Spotify or anywhere that the podcast is listed, hey, thank you for subscribing to me there. If you're in some of those colder areas, you're probably getting hit by the fall, which means it's gonna start getting chilly. You know what's great for when it's getting chilly? A nice hot cup of tea. And my wife happens to sell hot cups of tea. Loose leaf tea. You can supply the hot water. Etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea has all different kinds of loose leaf tea available for you guys to try out, including a Mr. Creepy Pasta tea. And like always, I want to give a very big special thank you to everybody who supports me out on Patreon, patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta. You guys, as always, are the real MVPs. 
And I'm talking about you specifically, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Ice, Bobby Carmen, Stephanie Butler, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Kraus, Reaper61167, Alex the Sandwich, Darth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Ness69420, Isodo Hatred, Nessie, Bardo Hawk 764, Ferb, Harley, Madam Skull Bunny, Sashi Sazaku, at Grizzly underscore Olsen dot pro, Hayden the Spooky Boy, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Ashwood, Lord of the Weebs, Jay, Miss Alexandra, Mr. Unsettling Spaghetti, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Fried Chicken 12, James Bruce, Freddy Krueger, Ty Nanny, Michael Scarborough, Infernal One, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Asset System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiwi the Sloth, Tommy Green, Festral Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nina Smith, Nico Kyle, Raphael Rodriguez, Guys, Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. You guys, and everyone on this list of names that I can't pronounce, and everybody in the description down below, and everyone who supports me on Patreon who doesn't get those things, but also supports, I love all of you. Thank you guys so much. Stick with me, because Halloween's a-coming, and sweet dreams.